Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's it going out there? It's February 21st. I'm Frank Kersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, why I break down the headlines and tell you what's really moving these markets. What an amazing run in Bitcoin and most cryptos over the past few weeks. So Bitcoin popped from 4000 in September to over $19,000 by mid-December. So you're looking inside of four months. And then what happened? The price crashed to 6000 in early February. That was less than two months. And you know what happens when you see that big crash? The headlines start coming out. Bitcoin's going to zero. It's going to be worthless. You deserve to lose money if you invest in Bitcoin. And then something weird happened. Bitcoin started to surge again. And it's been quiet. You're not seeing these big headlines all over CNBC, Bloomberg. You know, they used to have the price uh, of Bitcoin up on the screen the whole entire day, I think, in pretty much for December and January. Uh, uh, just having it in the quarter where Bitcoin is trading and all this stuff going on, having people on. Uh, it's been kind of quiet that it's moved. It, it didn't just move. It's up about 90% from its February lows. I mean, we're talking... Three weeks? It was traded above 11,000 again. I think it came a little bit below that today, which is Wednesday. But pretty remarkable comeback considering the headlines we saw from some of the world's greatest investors when this thing crashed. Right? They were trashing Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies. And, and as they were trashing it, what happened? Or what always happens when sentiment leans almost completely in one direction, which was negative. Bitcoin surged. Pretty close to 90%. Now, for someone who's been analyzing stocks and industries for almost my whole life, and I say that people listening to the first time, really, when you were a kid? I mean, listen, I grew up talking stocks at dinner table with my dad when I was a teenager. He ran his own investment firm for decades, wrote a financial newsletter for over 30 years, all over CNBC he used to take me. Was, everything was like stock-related, investments and stuff like that growing up. You know, I've been this just about my whole life. And the one lesson I learned, the one lesson, only one that I learned in my entire life. <laughs> but the one thing that I take and that I'm always able to, to look at going forward, even now to this day, is just because you're brilliant or someone's brilliant in one aspect of life, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a basketball player, scientist, whatever it is, that does not make you an expert in everything. And what do I mean by that? Let's look at Michael Jordan, who's the best basketball player that ever lived. Not sure if that's debatable. If you want to debate, don't debate with me. Debate with somebody else because the statistics show yeah, – whatever. We'll get into that. But just because Jordan's the greatest basketball player in the world doesn't mean that he knows how to run and manage an NBA team. I mean, if you see the Charlotte's, Charlotte Hornets, their record since he took over. What was that? Since 2010, I believe. So he became the controlling owner around then, and we're looking at – you're seven years as an owner, and you're looking at a team that made the playoffs three times? Three times? I mean, they never finished better than sixth. I mean, I don't know if you know basketball, and sixth is the whole Eastern Conference where the top eight make the playoffs. They never finished better than sixth in seven years. And just like most sports, when, you, you know, when you're a terrible team, you usually get good picks. And in basketball, it's really important because you only have 12 players. And like football, we have tons of players where one player, yeah, if it's a quarterback, they can impact it. But if you get one solid, great player, it could change your franchise. They're never able, never able to do that. We got a, 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 the Hornets who made the playoffs three times, lost the first round every year that they did make it, and not going to make the playoffs again this year. So again, the greatest basketball player in the world, but does that make him the greatest owner in the world? No, not necessarily. If you're a rich guy out there and you're looking to invest in a team or buy a team, uh, just just a quick note: if you operate in the same city for two decades and you happen to change the name of your team multiple times, that's really a bad sign. It means you're not marketable. And it was the Hornets from 89 to 04. It was the Bobcats. Remember the Bobcats from 04 to 2014? Then they changed it back to the Hornets. Well, they're always in Charlotte. Yeah. Just a little uh, something for the rich people looking to buy teams out there. But getting back to my point, if you look at Robert Schiller, Schiller's a great economist. Love the work he does on housing. Brilliant. But here's a guy that helped create the Case-Shiller Index, which is an alternative to the P-E ratio since you know, the alternative is it, it, 
devised the price of stocks by its average inflation adjusted earnings over the past 10 years. And this creates a P type ratio, which is also called CAPE, C A P E, based on CAPE, right? Get Schiller, help create this. Stocks trade at an average of 17 dating back for over 100 years. So, what does that mean? Under 17 is cheap, over 17 is expensive. Well, the CAPE ratio has been over 20 every year since 2010, basically since the end of the credit crisis. So as an investor, if you use this gauge to determine if stocks are expensive or whether you should just you know, be invested in our stocks or be in the sidelines, you basically miss the biggest bull market in the generation. The S&P surged 135% over this time frame, which basically makes CAPE rather useless when it comes to valuing the stock market. The lesson here is when an economist talks about stocks, run. Run as fast as you can. Run like a grizzly bear is about to eat you. Just run. Run as fast as you can. Don't ever listen. I love economists. Very smart people. But investing in stocks is much more than numbers and charts and bell curves. It requires common sense, having great networks, understanding people. And most economists I know, they don't know a lot of people outside of other economists. That's a big part of investing, especially determining sentiment. Not picking on economists there. I have an economist set of friends. You look at doctors, and there's amazing doctors out there. I interviewed some of the, on, on my podcast, including you and Ashley a few years ago, who analyzed the first human genome. This guy's co-director of the Stanford Clinical Genomics Program, founding director, inherited cardiovascular disease again, at Stanford. I mean, this guy's a big shot, huge, great guy. It was a great interview. It's from a couple of years ago. I have a ton of doctors as subscribers. They're brilliant. They give me great advice. My back when I had surgery. My wife when she had breast cancer. She's a survivor now. And everything's cool. But being a doctor doesn't mean you're an expert in engineering, in law, in coding. I mean, even when we look at, at, at Warren Buffett, who is the greatest investor of all time, but a guy that really doesn't understand technology at all. And he admitted that himself, saying, if I understood technology and software, he would have invested in, in Microsoft when Bill Gates first came to him in the late 80s, 90s, talking about his company. And now they're best friends. But Buffett's a value investor. He looks for companies that have competitive advantages, that generate huge cash flow, have a history of paying dividends. So he doesn't invest in companies during their high growth stages, like the Amazons, NVIDIA, Google, Illumina, Amgens. He's not a guy that looks at trends like IoT, big data, AI, robotics, quantum computing. You're going to be hearing a ton about that over the next few years. Because most of the companies early on are not going to generate meaningful earnings, meaningful sales. Just like what we saw when, when Microsoft was a young company and Apple. And once they became world dominators, that's when these names hit his radar. And he invested in Apple. And guys, I'm not knocking the greatest investor in the world here. I, I'm a huge Buffett fan. Also, personal ties as, you know, he sent a letter to my dad in the 80s with his signature. I actually signed it in pen after my dad sent him a copy of his book, which was called Awareness of Indirection. I had that letter framed in my office. I mean, he was probably... A lot easier to get access to Buffett back then in the 80s and 90s compared to now, obviously, with how many people show up to, to you know, his annual event for Berkshire. My point is, a guy like Warren Buffett is not the person that should be giving you advice on Bitcoin or blockchain. That's not what he's an expert in. I mean, Jamie Dimon and other hedge fund managers, right? They were ripping Bitcoin and blockchain. They, you have to see how much they scaled it back. Look at some of the recent quotes. As they learn more about these technologies and a huge demand from what? From the biggest demographic in America. That's millennials. Millennials are now bigger than baby boomers. But most of the experts I talk to in this industry, the real people invested in this trend for over five years, it's mathematicians, data miners, who understand blockchain, understand the crypto markets better than anyone. They were buying Bitcoin like crazy on this pullback and they were not traders. These are long-term investors. And when it comes to blockchain, which is a decentralized ledger, right? That's what it's called. What does that mean? It makes it almost impossible to hack, right? As it gets bigger and bigger, it gets much more impossible to hack, which provides the ultimate layer of security to protect all data. If you don't think that's a big deal, think Equifax, because everyone listening to this got their data stolen through Equifax, everybody. Okay, it's much larger than anybody believed. Hundreds of millions of people, If you look at a Fortune 500 companies, every one of them has been hacked over the past decade. Every one of them, if, if they say they haven't, they're lying. And if they come public and say that, a hacker will hack them immediately just to take credit for hacking them. Every one of them. 
I know hackers in the industry. I know some of the best hackers I grew up with. It's friends. Every one of them have been hacked. Every one. So obviously the current technology is not working. And now you're looking at the cloud. And more data than ever is being stored digitally. Trade secrets, Department of Defense stuff, emails, how we make our weapons, who we're spying on, algorithms used by Google and Amazon that are basically tracking and know exactly when you're going to go to the bathroom later today. And that's not a joke. It's not. It's insane. Protecting this data is important. And blockchain provides an amazing solution. Also, someone's trying to transfer money over a secure network to, to a family member who lives in another country. And that could be done almost instantly. For a tenth of the fee, a bank is going to charge you. I mean, think about that. Since it takes like, what, three days to open a brokerage account? Over a full day to wire money where a bank is charging you to transfer your own money digitally from one place to another? It's not like they're carrying it in a truck that could be hijacked and the driver's at risk and you're paying for that. It's digital. It's pressing a button. You got to get charged for that while I'm making no interest at all on the money that, that's being stored at your bank. I mean, the banks love fees. Financial companies love fees. They fee us to death. And again, with those low interest rates, they're paying us nothing to keep our money stored. Now, why is that important? It's important because you see how important blockchain is where just about every major financial company is investing big money to build their own blockchain network. You've seen venture capital money go into the space. That's putting its stamp of approval saying, wow, this thing is for real. Really, Goldman, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, every stock exchange, consulting firms, even the biggest, Accenture, asset managers, BlackRock, Fidelity, tech companies. You go to Microsoft, Intel, Google, IBM, Oracle. You keep going and going. And this is a real trend, and Bitcoin is the main currency. Now, with every disruptive trend, whether it's IoT, 3D printing, cloud, big data, it's always, always, always going to be tons of volatility. I mean, new technology within these trends is changing all the time. If we look at data mining specifically in cryptocurrencies, you can data mine for Ethereum, Litecoin, those use GPU, GPUs, which is, you, know, you need to have the best graphic cards, which increase speed, but also need to use less power, right? So then you look at NVIDIA and AMD. Those are the companies that supply those cards, especially NVIDIA, the best in the business. But if you're mining for Bitcoin, it's different. You need special chips. I want to get too technical here. They're called Application Specific Integrated Circuit Devices, or ASIC. And the company with the best ASIC technology is Bitmain, which is a privately owned company in China. And their newest tech available is called the Antminer S9. How do I know all this jargon, all this stuff, all this nonsense? It seems like, wow, all these terms are – it's important to understand. And I know this stuff because I drove six hours from Vancouver to Washington in a snowstorm, unfortunately, to visit a large data mining facility where thousands of these ant miners, these machines, were working at once to produce Bitcoin, seeing the, how the whole process is done. The heat in this facility gets over to 200 degrees, so you need massive cooling systems where all this requires tons of electricity use. That's why the biggest data miners have their facilities located where? In ice cold areas. If someone says, hey, we have a, a, a data mining facility located in New York, sell it short the company. It doesn't work. It's not going to work. Especially for Bitcoin. The GPU is a little bit different. Mine's Ethereum, stuff like that. If you're looking at those areas like Washington, Iceland, Sweden, also where the cost of electricity is very, very cheap. Plus, I know some of the major players in this industry. They spent tons of time asking hundreds and hundreds of questions. They probably hate me by now. Why? Because this industry is fascinating. How algorithms check the price of Bitcoin against things like Bitcash and other cryptocurrencies, mine using ASICs, right? So what they do is they determine where the best margins are. So they're not just mining Bitcoin. If they see these algorithms where there's better margins mining a different cryptocurrency, it automatically mine that other currency until, say, Bitcoin becomes more favorable in terms of economics. And this is being checked every few seconds, every minute. It's remarkable how these systems operate. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's tons of companies trying to take advantage of this trend. They open up data mining facilities, looking to raise cash in the private market. 
A lot of these companies have come to Curzio Research since we offer private placements, my Curzio Venture Opportunities newsletter. But for me, knowing the economics, price per kilowatt, what technology they plan on using, stuff I learned over the past year of traveling, being in the room, going all over the world, talking to the biggest and best players in the space. That allows me basically a one day looking at your entire company, I can tell whether you're going to be successful or have no shot of becoming a fully operational data miner over the long term. My point to all this, learn everything you can about cryptocurrencies and blockchain. It's an industry still in its infancy in terms of how many sectors it could possibly disrupt. They're great sources all over Google. Read about these technologies and what they actually do. And a lot of these sites, you know, have a layman's term, very easy to understand because it is difficult. And most investors really know about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, but not a lot are actually invested in these things or invested in companies like this. But listen to the people you trust, not those that rush into this market and sell you something without really understanding the industry or, or knowing the main players or ever talking about Bitcoin or, or data mining or blockchain before. And for me, I just published my Curzio Research Advisory Newsletter. A lot of subscribers listen to the podcast, which included three new crypto stock recommendations. These are legit companies. It's a small mid cap and large cap company I recommended. They have exposure to this trend and likely to become leaders in this massive growth space. I spent a lot of hours researching these names because you know, we're seeing even on a crypto stock front, some of these names are being halted. We had Riot Blockchain, a big investigation came out from CNBC. A lot of crap out there you need to avoid and be aware of, which is good for the industry. It's being policed. You see more regulation come out. That's what you want when you have something like this that can disrupt industries that have been crushing individual investors and people for, for decades through fees and all this garbage. So in March, we're officially launching Barry Cohen's cryptocurrency newsletter where Barry's the smartest man I know in this business when it comes to investment advice and giving investment advice on cryptocurrencies. And companies come to him before launching their ICOs, which he plans on recommending ICOs in his newsletter, which is a service I'm not really seeing too much out there. And a lot of people trade the cryptocurrencies. Some of them recommend a few stocks in the market, crypto stocks. But investing specifically in ICOs, initial coin offering, guys, you get a 25%, sometimes a 35% discount when you're an early investor to these things as they go through different stages of raising money before they officially become trading on whatever exchange they decide to go on. And by the way, Barry thinks 90% of these are worthless. So you can imagine how much analysis goes behind each one of these he looks at, which I believe there's over 1,500 now cryptocurrencies and expect to go over 3,000 this year. And if you look in terms of market capitalization, it's around $500 million in total market cap cryptocurrencies and expected to go over a trillion. So I said 500, so 500 billion to over a trillion dollars this year. And we're talking about Bitcoin being at 11 grand here. Not at 19,000. I'm not just you know, throwing numbers at you. That's how big this market is. So there'll be a lot of great opportunities for investors to make a lot of money. And that's why we're going all in on crypto here. It's an industry I believe in. It's an industry I spent a lot of time researching. An industry most investors still don't understand. It's an industry that, that you can make life-changing gains in if you listen to the right people. That includes people who have been researching this industry for years, investing, investing in this industry for, for, for years. Really understand the metrics behind running a real company in this industry five to ten years from now. Because we're going to continue to see massive volatility and these massive swings. I mean, I said earlier in the intro, it's 4,000 to 19,000, down to six, up to 11. And we're looking just from September to today. Pretty crazy moves. But you want to invest in someone who understands these things or knows how to manage risk, which is critical to running a crypto business over the long term, especially with the volatility that we're going to see. Now, one professional who's been investing and analyzing companies in the crypto industry for a long time is Chris Dunn. They might not sound familiar to you because he's a first-time guest. He's going to be interviewing in just a minute. He's been featured on CNBC, Fox Business, Business Insider, Huffington Post, so many places. Been educating people about cryptos for several years now. I like Chris. Similar to Nate Flanders, who I interviewed last week. He, he's not about hype. 
or highlights how much money you could make painting this perfect picture for investors, which I see out there. You're going to become a millionaire. I'm going to guarantee it and crazy stuff like that. He's a guy that focuses more on risks because if you limit your downside, you're going to give yourself more of a chance to make a lot of money in many of these cryptocurrencies, which some we've seen move 10,000% or more in months. It's crazy. We're not seeing that in all of them. We're not even seeing that in most of them, just a few. But by limiting your downside to some of the other ones, it gives you the opportunity. You know, you're not going to lose all your money in one thing that's all hyped up, but it'll give you the opportunity to, to maybe invest in some of these that are seeing these massive moves. And Chris is going to share his thoughts on the latest volatility in Bitcoin, how regulation is going to impact the industry, and share some of his favorite ideas. That's going to be a fantastic, fantastic interview. And later on, we're going to have a really good education segment for you, which includes... Break down Walmart's quarter. The retail giant reported a week in expected earnings. That was on Tuesday. The stock got crushed for more than 10 percent. It's down a few more percent today. That segment is not only about Walmart, but what you can learn from this experience since you would have spotted this pullback coming from a mile away using this simple technique. And guys, this isn't just a tool you can use for Walmart, but almost every retail stock, which is kind of important since. We're going to see a ton of retailers report earnings over the next two weeks. You'll be able to use this strategy right now, which not only hope you buy the right retail stocks heading into the earnings quarter, but it's also going to prevent you from losing money on retail stocks that you already own. It's going to be a really great educational segment. You don't want to miss it. Trust me on that one. But before I break down Walmart and the retail industry, let's get to my interview with cryptocurrency trader Chris Dunn. Chris Dunn, thanks so much for coming on Wall Street Unplugged. How's everything going, man? Man, I'm great. I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it. Wow. We were supposed to have you on the show earlier. We ran into a couple hiccups on my end, right? I should blame you. But it's on my end 100%, though. I got to take the blame for it. But I'm so glad you came on the show and being flexible. Uh, you know, I've been following your stuff. And I want you to introduce yourself since you're a first-time guest because you are a cryptocurrency trader. I put, I've been putting some traders on here and people learn about these markets. We had a lot of questions on it. Um, how long have you been actually doing this in the markets? What I read about you've been doing it for a very long time, and I wanted to see, you know, what made you get into this market, which is obviously pretty hot over the last, let's say, 12 months or so. But before that, you are not seeing too many cryptocurrency traders around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my, my background is I actually started trading stocks and futures back in the early 2000s when I was in high school. And um, that was fun for a long time. And then after 2008, um, I noticed that the the markets just started to become more competitive, and after the the global financial crisis, uh, every year volatility and trading volume was falling in the stock market, and so I was always just kind of looking for other alternative markets. And in 2011, one of my hedge fund buddies shot me an email and was like, "Hey man, check out this thing, Bitcoin. Uh, it's, it looks pretty interesting, but it it looks also kind of scammy." So I took a look at a chart, and I think this was the, like the bubble of like the summer in 2011, where the price went from like 50 cents to 30 bucks, and then cr crashed down to like two bucks. And I looked at it and said, "Man, this looks like a penny stock pump and dump. It's probably a fad or some scam. I really don't have time to look at it." And over the next couple of years, just kind of paid attention. But in 2013, um, in the spring of 2013, I took it much more seriously after it. Uh, had its second bubble where it ramped up from like thirty dollars to over two hundred and fifty, and I realized I'm like, man, there's something here. This is real. It's not going away. It, it just keeps growing, and I keep hearing more about it. And so that year, I actually shifted my focus from the traditional equities markets to crypto. And so that was coming up on five years ago, and it was probably the best decision I ever made. Now, you say you're a trader, but it seems like even at 2011, getting in at those prices, I, I guess I would say it would be pretty cool just to buy and hold maybe <laughs> if, you, if you knew what the market was going to happen five years from now. But I wanted to compare yeah. back back then, right, Chris? I mean, so, so you look at 2011, it's, and I'm glad you said like you know, you, you've seen you know, the market come up and crashing. And now people – you know, you're used to that from 2011, but now look what's happened to the market where – 
you know, you're seeing the, the, the massive swings, right? You see Bitcoin go up to 20,000. Then we've come all the way back down to, I think you traded below 6,500 a couple of weeks ago. Now you're pushing past 10,000 again. You're kind of used to this. Is it as a trader, are you kind of expecting this? Is this normal volatility? Because for most people, they're like, oh man, I can't believe how crazy this is. But if someone's been there for five years, you, you probably got to be used to these wild price swings, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, man. I mean, the, the crypto markets basically have a five phase cycle that they go through where, you know, price is quiet, it's low, nobody's talking about it. We call that the accumulation phase. And then like we saw in 2016, we call that the, the early trend where you have just beautiful market structure, the markets making reasonable gains o over several months. And then what happened in December 2017 was things just got out of control. It went parabolic. We went from 8K to like 20,000 in less than a month. And that's phase three, where you have kind of a parabolic blow off top. And then phase four is the fast crash, which catches everybody off guard. And then we go into phase five, which is high volatility for a while, and then rinse and repeat back into accumulation and then early trend. So that's what Bitcoin does. You know, it, it, it goes through these big boom and bust cycles. And what's been interesting is ever since its inception, after every bubble bursts, over time, the price just keeps going up. So it's a wonderful market to be an investor. It's also a great market to be an active trader, and I actually do both. And that's something I wanted to discuss, because I'll get to, to more of the trading part in a minute, but for someone who's been this to 2011, I'm sure you look at, you know, when I say fundamentals, I'm not looking at, you know, the fundamentals of ICOs or things that you're trading. But the fundamentals of Bitcoin, when you look at it, how real it is, how it's getting more adopted, and you're seeing, like even today, which you haven't seen in 2011, 12, 13, really, where the biggest companies in the world are, are you know, the, the underlying technology, right, blockchain. A lot of these guys are investing in it. Thousands of patents are being taken out. It, it, it's pretty crazy right now. So how do you look at it as, as fundamental where you say, wow, Bitcoin is real. This is real, not just Bitcoin, but cryptocurrencies. And, and, What's your thought on that? I mean, is this something that's going to be much, much bigger? Is this something – how do you look at it from that point of view? And then we'll talk more about the trading part. That literally is the trillion-dollar question, right? And and when it comes to like analyzing the fundamentals of cryptocurrencies, it's really difficult to do because it's brand new. You know, For the first time in human history, we have true currency competition, meaning you know, a, you know currencies are coming out of places that aren't – you know launched by a king or a central government or something like that. Like anybody can start a currency and compete on a global scale. And we're seeing this gold rush and this just this true competition. And really it's a fight. I mean, it's, it's so interesting. It's like every day there's new drama or, or new, you know, innovation or new mistakes that are, you know, code that's getting broken. And so it's just a really fun place to be. And I'm excited to be a part of it because I, I've been a geek for financial markets, like I said, ever since high school. And I just, I think the, the concept of money as a, as just a social construct is really interesting. You know, if you think of like the history of money, how we used to trade, you know, cattle and shells and then gold, and then we had gold backed money. And then we went into fiat money that was backed by fake people had in governments. And now the, the next evolution is math based decentralized money, right? So it's just a really fun and interesting and profitable place to be right now. Well, Chris, you, there's so many people that call themselves trade, cryptocurrency trades. You're, you're a, a legit guy. has been doing this for a long time. You've been on feature on CNBC, yeah, uh, Huffington Post, Fox News, a lot, a lot of different things, you know? So when you look at this industry right now, where you see so many people forcing themselves into it, maybe to try to make a quick buck, what are your feelings out there? Like, what do you, would you say to individual investors who it seems like you spend a lot of time trying to teach them and help them out, but there's a lot of noise out there from people that came out of nowhere that all of a sudden they call themselves cryptocurrency experts, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Over the past year, I mean, the the kind of the the gold rush has just kicked into insane, ridiculous levels, and and. My advice, and again, I'm not like a financial advisor, but my advice to anybody who's looking to get into this space or asking the question, like, should I buy Bitcoin? Uh, my opinion is everybody should own at least a little bit of Bitcoin to understand how it works and, you know, what what's actually happening. This, this isn't something that you want to ignore and then look back five or 10 years from now and be like, man, I would have, could have, should have, you know. Um, but at the same time, like, I think there's just a lot of stupidity that's been happening too. Like, I've 
heard stories of people, you know, mortgaging their house and buying crypto on credit cards. And um, somebody sent me an email the other day saying their dad put their wedding fund into Bitcoin at like 17,000 and now they're, they, they can't have a wedding. So I just, I, you know, on my YouTube channel and all the education stuff that I do, first and foremost, like I, I try to preach just sound investing and, and risk and money management, because if you get that wrong, if you chase the herd, which, you know, a lot of people, well, everybody knows inherently buy low, sell high, right? But there's a reason why 90% or more of people do the exact opposite. And it's because we're humans, we're emotion, you know, we have emotions and people that let their emotions dictate their investing and trading decisions are the ones that will consistently lose over time or the ones that take the time to learn about mass human psychology and bubbles and chart patterns and stuff like that. Those are the ones that have, you know, a much higher probability of success over the long run. Yeah, that's a crazy story. The wedding money. That may be a good thing, though, right? Maybe they didn't get married. That could have been a good thing. Could have saved that person. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Might have saved him a lot of heartache. Who knows? I, I know, right? Uh, but, yeah, it, it, you know, we're making fun of it. But, yeah, you hear stories like that. It's pretty crazy. And you see, you know, again, people, you only hear about the positive things, right? Everyone's like, oh, this cryptocurrency went up 10,000%. This one's up 50,000%. You know, most of them go down, and people aren't really talking about those. And it's unfortunate that these are the, you know, so many. Amateur investors get get caught up in that hype, which leads me to this question, I guess. Maybe a good segue. Uh, if, if someone listening to this and, and they don't own Bitcoin, what's the easiest way? It's an easy question for you, easy question for me. But let's, you know, a lot of my listeners, great people, have their own businesses and just want to learn more. Uh, how do they, what's the first step in doing this? I mean, maybe they might think, you know, go into Coinbase or, or you know, what's, what's the, the simplest thing you could tell them to get started if they wanted to get started and own Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, go somewhere like Coinbase that has a link to your checking account um, where you can just easily buy and sell. And then from there, there's about a half a dozen or so other crypto exchanges that you can trade spot crypto markets through. And what you want to do, I, I don't know if your audience is mostly U.S. based or not, but um, what you want to do is look at the exchanges that are trading the largest um, trading volume you know, where most of the, the liquidity is. And that's where you, if you are going to be an active trader, that's where you want to go. You want to stay away from, you know, low volume exchanges where you could get slippage or get trapped in trades. And once you get onto those exchanges too, what I'm hearing, which is, which is what I love, if you, you know, you punch up Chris Dunn on, on Google, guys, you'll, you'll go right to his site where, you know, you, you explain to people exactly, you know, how, how, what to use, how you're investing in this stuff and, and use, you know, what, whatever it is to you know, different charts and stuff like that. What I'm hearing out there too, as well, is th there's really not a lot of great platforms to the point where they're showing new investors how to trade these things like learning tools. It seems like every single platform you go on is incredibly difficult. Is that true? Or do you have an easy platform? Or is it kind of like make your business easier, which is why you have a great you know program to help these people? Yeah, I mean, there is like a technical barrier to entry for some people, um, but I, I assume your listeners are more savvy than most and, and, you know, understand how like stock brokerage accounts work and stuff like that. And so that that helps a lot. Um, the biggest thing is just understanding how to keep your, your crypto secure. You know, the biggest mistake I see new investors and traders make is they look at these exchanges like FDIC insured um, bank accounts, which they're not, they're, they're extremely risky. And so the, the best place to actually store your crypto is on a hardware wallet, like a, a little USB device that you can keep in a safety deposit box or bury in your backyard. Um, and if you just, you know, kind of Google like uh, crypto exchange hacks, like you'll see so many exchanges over the years have, have been hacked. And if you have your crypto on those exchanges, you lose them. So first and foremost, keep that in mind. Um, and then as far as like, you know, trading execution and charting, th there's a couple of good platforms out there. Uh, Coinigy is one. Um, another one is TradingView. And some of these platforms are setting up APIs where you can actually trade through their platform and they'll link to the different exchanges. So that's kind of helping. Um, there's definitely a lot of room for improvement in the like order execution and just reliability of these exchanges because, you know, whenever there's big volatility, most, if not all of these exchanges have issues where the websites will go down or, you know, you'll, you'll just have issues getting executed on fills. 
And so the, uh, there's just a lot of room for innovation. And we're seeing, you know, like a couple months ago, the CME and the SIBO launched um, regulated futures in the U.S. So we're seeing bigger exchanges um, also in like Switzerland, we're seeing futures products, options, you know, other derivatives that are coming out that I think are going to make it easier for the average investor to get into it. So, Chris, you have, you know, I've seen that that you have conferences and stuff like that and seminars. What's the number one question that you get from people that always ask the same thing? Like, hey, what's the top cryptocurrency? What are you looking at now to buy? Is, is that really it or is it just more alerting and people want to just, you know, get familiarized with this stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen people from all walks of life. Like, I've, I've in our community, we have professional traders that have been trading for decades. We have people in, you know, Southeast Asia or Africa or South America that have never traded anything before. And so that's what I love about crypto is the the barrier to entry is so low, and we're just seeing such a diverse and really young um, group of people coming into crypto. Um, and so the, you know, I get questions, uh, probably the most common is, Hey, what do you think of X, Y coin? Um, and now there's over 1500 crypto assets that are tradable in some form or fashion. So, um, it's really hard to keep up with everything, but, um, I just try to trade and invest in the projects that have either the most liquidity, if they're already trading on an exchange or show the best promise if they're, you know, if they're just doing an ICO and they haven't been listed on an exchange. So to answer your question, I guess the, the most common questions are, what, what do you think of this coin or what do you think? Should I buy now or sell? I mean, that's the biggest question is, you know, all about timing, which is why I do a lot of YouTube videos just kind of talking about the bigger market cycles in crypto, um, because a lot of people have FOMO, right? Like fear of missing out and they buy just because they don't want to miss the big trend. But again, emotional investors and traders are typically the ones that buy the top and then panic sell the low. So you talked earlier real quick about you, and just a couple more questions here. You talked earlier about your system, uh, or I don't know if it was a system where you're looking at the markets where it was like a five thing period, quiet period. I think it was early trend, parabolic, fast crash, high volatility. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of the same system that you're looking at when it comes to individual cryptocurrencies? Where okay, obviously, you know, maybe an ICO might not be a quiet period. Maybe you know, there's 1500 out there a quiet period. But what alerts you to the ones that? Yeah, is is it that early trend phase where you'll see it, you know, start trending and getting more volatility and stuff? What what alerts you to the ones that I guess um, have huge promise that because you see, you know, people. And it is the toughest question, right? Because I get it. everybody wants to know how you invest in the best one, the earliest. But what are some of the, yeah. your biggest success stories of investing in some of the things that you saw through maybe your trading system? So so here's I kind of the best strategy for eliminating the noise and finding the best investments early. Um, so, you know, I, I get emails, dozens of emails every day from different ICOs that are launching that want publicity. And, and, you know, I don't get paid to promote, by the way, like I'm not a promoter. But what that does is it gives me the ability to see what ICOs are coming down the line. And, uh, and for anybody that doesn't know, ICO, uh, initial coin offering, so basically a new cryptocurrency or a new uh, token or a new crypto asset. And so what I'll do is, uh, you know, we have a team of people that are way smarter than I am that are way more technical because I'm, I'm a trader. I'm not like a programmer. I can't audit code and read white papers and, you know, speak intelligently about that stuff. So I let my team handle that, do due diligence, figure out what the good projects are. And then usually we just wait for the ICO to happen and wait for the, the token to be listed on some exchanges. And then we look for early signs of interest. So, you know, typically whenever a coin gets listed on the exchange, it dumps right away because the ICO investors will just sell to, you know, the first chance they have at liquidity. That will cause the, the price to usually crash on the chart. Once it stabilizes and we start to see some, you know, predictable and, and just some heavy liquidity coming into the crypto, uh, then we'll invest. So, for example, like Ethereum, we started buying Ethereum at $1.50 in um, 2016, um, which was higher than the, the initial price. But we had confirmation that the price was stable. It was trading on exchanges. So that's what I like to do. 
find what I think are good projects early, watch them, pay attention, and then really only invest or start actively trading once they hit the exchange and you can actually make sense of the price action. Okay, and we'll finish with this question here because we all remember our biggest winners. And for me, I always remember my biggest losers, right? So, what yeah. is something? That, what is something you could tell maybe my audience about you know, the, mis- the the biggest mistakes people make? When you said fear of missing out, obviously it is one of them. But what are some of the other things in this industry? Because, you know, let's face it, we saw Bitcoin go from you know four thousand to nineteen thousand to six thousand, back up to ten thousand, probably in like a three four month span, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, what yeah. are some of the things that I mean? Is it limiting your loss? Is is it you know? I, I'm just curious to see like what have you learned over that time period? Because when you, the, the reason why you become a great trader is because you learn from your mistakes. So that's why I wanted to try to get out from you today. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, kind of one of the most obvious ones that everybody knows but nobody does is position sizing. Like whenever you get into a trade, <clears throat> everybody just wants to cheerlead their trade and look at reasons why that trade is going to win. Um, anytime I get in a trade, I actually obsess over the downside risk and say, okay, what are the scenarios that could cause this trade or this investment to fail? And what would that look like, right? Like think like a chess player, think about all the possible outcomes that you can. And then out of those possibilities, what is the highest probability play, right? And if you can get into something where there's good risk to reward, that those are typically the best trades. But what a lot of people do is they just they kind of blindly just buy and hope and they don't think about the downside. And then they'll either trade, you know, too, with too much leverage or be undercapitalized or not think about stop losses and things like that. And then have an account crippling loss, which maybe really should have been a small loss. No, it definitely makes sense, man. And I appreciate you explaining that. So, Chris, uh, thank you so much for coming on again. It's been, uh, you know. My fault. We've been going back and forth. A lot of things going on personally, and I appreciate you—you know—you you being patient with us and coming on because I really wanted to get you on. I, I've done a lot of research on you now. How good of a trader you are, and how you really help investors. Um, if someone wants to find some of your work, how, how could they do that? Yeah, um, they can find me at uh, chrisdunn.com uh, or on, on YouTube and everywhere on social media. Chris Dunn TV, so at Chris Dunn TV on YouTube. All right, that's perfect. Well, Chris, thanks so much for joining us. And listen, stay in touch. Hopefully we'll get you back on soon. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me, Frank. Appreciate it. Great stuff from Chris. That awesome guy. The highlights are risk much more than and talking about the huge profits you can generate, which I love. Because it's so easy to get caught up with the few cryptocurrencies that surge 5,000, 10,000% in a few months when most have gotten crushed. So I really appreciate Chris coming on. Be very honest with you. Love his style. Love the interview. But this podcast is about you, not about me. I know you're still interested in this cryptocurrency uh, industry. I'm getting tons of emails. I want to put the right people in front of you. This way, that could really help you, you know, generate long-term returns in this industry. So uh, again, I always say the podcast is about you, not about me. So let me know what you thought at Frank at CurziorResearch.com. That's Frank at CurziorResearch.com. Now, let's get to my educational segment. It's gonna be really good. It's about Walmart. One of the largest big box retailers in the world fell 10% on Tuesday after reporting earnings and guidance that fell short of estimates. Sure, you know the story was everywhere. 10% is a pretty big move in one day considering Walmart's market cap is over $300 billion. Now it's around two seventy five ish but they lost $30 billion in market cap in one day. Now to put that in perspective, there's only about 200 companies in S&P 500 that have a market cap greater than $30 billion. If you look at the rest, the other 300 companies, about 308 to be exact, have market caps below $30 billion. And so we're so used to seeing the Apple's huge, Google huge, Amazon huge market caps. Once you get past like the first 100 companies, yeah, the rest of the S&P 500 companies are not really that big, especially when you get past 200 compared to the rest of the guys. But I have to tell you, Walmart falling 10% after earnings – this decline should have come to no surprise to you. If you listen to my Frankly Speaking podcast from Friday or if you watch my live Facebook video on my Curzio Research Facebook page, I'm not patting myself on the back here, guys. You know I always cover my losers much more than my winners because you always learn much more from you losing positions. But Walmart's pullback was pretty easy to spot for several reasons. Now, I want to start with the quarter since Walmart didn't really report terrible numbers. Let's look at the negatives and consensus estimates call for 2018 earnings to come in at $5.05. 
Warren said earnings will come in around 490, so a slight miss there, not a big deal. But they did have some big inventory markdowns from closing some Sam's Clubs. If you're not familiar with Sam's Clubs, uh, it's the Walmart's version of Costco. But the big headline was e-commerce sales, where that growth slowed to 23% from 50% year over year. If you get e-commerce, guys, e-commerce is huge for every retailer not named Amazon. Everyone's playing catch-up to Amazon. More e-sales business or e-commerce business. You know, again, you're not having to, to pay all the upfront costs in, in, in leases, managing these stores, massive amount of employees. I mean, the more you can push to e-commerce, again, they're still trying to find that mix. But it's safe to say almost every company outside of Amazon and a few others needs to increase sales from e-commerce. So to see that slow down, that's probably the number one reason why the stock fell so much. When you take a closer look under the hood, you have same-store sales increased by 2.6%. That's a very important gauge in retail. Same-store sales are stores that were open for a, uh, 12 months or longer. They compare them year over year, so it would be this February from last February. 2.6% is a great number for Walmart. It's a lot higher than a historical average. Store traffic increased by 1.6%. Why ticket sales increased 1%. What does that mean? I don't want to just throw numbers at you. It means Walmart was able to charge more for its products, ticket sales. They're able to raise prices, and it didn't hurt traffic because store traffic still increased by 1.6%. That's really important for a company like Walmart because they're a discount retailer. And sometimes discount retailers or like discount airlines have trouble raising prices since their customers, I won't say are always cheap, but they always expect cheap things. So when they get raised, you can see those customers move and maybe go to dollar stores or whatever. Those are pretty important metrics. Those are positives. And when it comes to e-commerce, remember, like I said, the number one reason the stock fell, that's the biggest headline. Growth slow, but it had to slow because the comps were bad. When we say comps, it's comparing uh, one year to, to the following year. Just like I said earlier, it's like February to last February. Now, why were the comps bad is because Walmart bought Jets.com, massive online retailer, about two years ago. So they went from little online sales to strong online sales. And the comparisons were really good year over year because the following year you didn't – yeah, little sales. The next year you just bought this massive company that focused on online sales. Now, what happens the following year? Those comps, right, when you look at those comparisons are not as easy to match. So, of course, growth is going to slow when you look at it because they're going up against much difficult comps. And it's always more difficult for a company to grow percentage-wise as you get bigger. And think about it this way. It's a, if you're growing your business from $10 million to $50 million, it, that's massive growth, right? Say the first year you happen to have, knock it out of the park. You're looking at your company growing 400%. But then if you go from $50 million to $100 million, that's remarkable, Hey, that, that's that's you know, now you're you know you're huge. You you're, you're you could be an industry leader in some spaces. Yeah, you know, amazing growth. Yet that amounts to a hundred percent compared to four hundred percent the previous year. So the percentage goes down. It looks bad, but to be honest, growing your company by a hundred percent from fifty million to a hundred billion is remarkable. So I thought the headlines were a little misleading on e-commerce growth for Walmart. Plus, the company lowered earnings, and this surprised the street when they lowered earnings. And it wasn't, when I say it surprised the street, it wasn't factored into their models. Because one of the reasons they lowered earnings is because they plan to spend a lot more money on e-commerce acquisitions to grow, which is not a terrible thing. You have to spend money to make money. So when I look under the hood, the numbers were not that bad, which begs the question, well, why did Walmart fall by 10% then? Am I the only analyst that saw these numbers? And the answer is kind of simple. Walmart is a really, really expensive stock. Sounds simple, I know. And my Facebook Live video, and when I answered the retail question from Friday's Frankly Speaking, I said, retail is the one sector where value trumps growth. Every other sector, the market wants to see growth over value. If you see growth, you get rewarded. If you look at cyclicals, discretionary, energy, tech, biotech, growth trumps value everywhere right now. It's been trumping value over the past four to five years. But in retail... Value is a much better play here. If you look at retail, that's what we've been pounding the table on retail since November when the whole world was telling you, malls are dead, the apartment store is dead. Bro, it's over. Don't come at me, bro. Whatever they say, right? The millennials, oh, no way. Even though they're crowded, you can't even get in some of these places. It's amazing during the holiday season, right? They're not going to be existence five years from now. And the analyst I was saying that in CBC, 
after they get off, they have the golf course, smoke cigars with their friends, since most of those guys can't read a balance sheet. So the other world hated department stores and retail in general. It was nice to see our call where a lot of these names, Macy's, Coles, J.C. Penney, surged off their lows. But even after the big moves in these stocks, and here's what's different with Walmart. If you look at Macy's, Coles, even Target, these companies are still cheap. If you look at companies like Target, which was one that I was wrong on. I didn't like this name just below 60 bucks and it's over 70, but Target trades 13 times forward earnings. Macy's trades at 10 times forward earnings. Kohl's trades at 13 times forward earnings. Walmart heading into this quarter traded at an astronomical 22 times earnings. This is a company that usually has a market multiple. This is a company that, that trades in line with its peers, its big box buddies. Hey, Walmart's not Amazon or Shopify. It doesn't deserve a massive, massive premium over its competitors. Plus, if you look since October, Walmart is up an incredible 40% heading into this quarter. That's much more than the average retailer, department store stock, most of them in the industry. So what does that mean? It means expectations are crazy high. And we know since, I know you listened to my educational segment from last week about earnings, right? I know all you guys listen to that. If not, you should listen to it. It's pretty interesting. Around 80% of companies are beating early estimates this quarter. Yet the ones that do, the stock price falls an average of 2%. That's what's happening. So what does that tell you? Walmart, owning Walmart into the quarter, especially if you long 6 October and enjoyed that massive 40% run-up, chances are the stock was going to sell off after reporting earnings, no matter what the numbers were, even if they were really good. However, if they were in line, it probably would have fell 5%, 3%, but they missed. And when you miss and you don't meet those high expectations, what happens? Not only did you see a 10% decline in the stock yesterday, but the stock's down today. Again, it's Expectations are extremely high. Now, Friday's, frankly speaking, I mentioned how the retail sector, the stocks that were the best plays into earnings were the ones with super low expectations. What do I mean? Well, Under Armour, everybody hates Under Armour now, right? Surged 25% with reporting inline earnings and guidance. Fossil, stock that got crushed, reported earnings up 70% last week. Even Target had low expectations. Not a lot of people liked it, including me. What I was hearing out there, targets, most of them, not see a ton of in-store traffic. They were discounting items heavily, which I thought would crush margins, but apparently e-commerce is out of the park, which surprised me. Now, how can we take what we learned from Walmart and their quarter and use it over the next two weeks since we're going to have about 20 big retailers reporting earnings over the next two weeks? And how do we do that? Be careful owning expensive retailers that have run up considerably into the quarter. Especially a big box in department stores. Because if they beat, the stock's likely going to sell off. That's the trend. And if they don't, it's going to be a 10% plus sell-off minimum. Or a 10% sell-off minimum, probably more than that, like we saw in Walmart. And also look to buy the retailers that are cheap, like Macy's, where, yes, the stock has also run higher, but not as much. It's up about 20%, half the amount since October as a company that's dirt cheap right now, expectations are low. So if they miss, you may not see that dramatic sell-off that we saw at Walmart, at least not right away where the stock may open lower by 3% and finish the day down 15% because of algos. These algorithms trigger and they come in. So it basically means you'll be able to, to sell your position if they miss, as long as it's not some outrageous miss, slower traffic, we got to close more stores, as long as it's not something absolutely crazy. But if it comes in a little bit light, the stock will probably still go up because expectations are low. And if Macy's reports just in-line earnings, you'll probably see the stock pop at least 5%. But if they beat earnings, if they beat the low expectations, you're looking at a stock that could probably surge 15% plus in one day, and it's going to be all over top headlines everywhere. Everywhere. Bloomberg, CNBC, Market Watch, all the sites. That's how I would trade retail. And some of these companies are still great long-term investments. As trading going into the quarter, that's what I'm seeing. That's what I've been talking about the past week, week and a half about retailers. And you're looking at Walmart up 40%, huge, super expensive stock. They just missed a little bit. The numbers weren't too bad, but it deserves to pull back that much. And when it's like 10%, Walmart, biggest stock, they don't say that the stock's been up 40% before that. They don't say that the stock's trading at 22, 23 times earnings, which is about 40%, 30, 40% higher than its average multiple that it usually trades. And the analysts just went crazy. You just inflated expectations. The stock missed, and it's come down. So just be careful going into the quarter. 
because value right now is trumping growth in retail. It's the only sector I'm seeing that. Where you could buy stocks on the cheap, stocks with low expectation, and even if they miss, you're not really going to see that huge, huge, huge downward pressure on it as long as they don't miss and report a horrible quarter, like a kitchen sink quarter. And even in-line earnings would be good. And if they report better expected earnings, you're going to see nice pops like we saw at what? Under Armour Fossil stocks have gotten murdered over the past six, eight, nine months. And now you just return investors really, really good returns. That's how I would play the retail market. Okay, guys, be sure to check out my Curzio Research Facebook page. You could have learned a lot for free last week by watching the live videos. And you can also make fun of me when I do make mistakes because they are live. But seriously, it's a, it's a really great source of free information where we don't give away – well, we do give away a lot in terms of uh, information and research, but not stock picks, which is reserved for our paid subscribers, which allows us to actually run our business and we're always appreciative of that, uh, which is really great stuff. And we have so many loyal followers and subscribers that, that you yeah. know, Again, it's humbling. It's great. It's awesome. It just provide the best service possible for those guys. But uh, on the Curzio uh, Research Facebook page, you're going to find uh, some really great content, uh, especially through our weekly breakdown newsletter that we publish every week, highlighting the most interesting stock stories. We also publish our podcast, including Michael Alkins. He just launched his new podcast, guys. We publish our podcast on Facebook and our website since some of you do not listen to podcasts through iTunes, which is cool. That's fine, even though it's kind of like eating a loaf of bread that's not sliced, which you can now do in case nobody told you about that. But we do have investors that just like to go to websites instead of listening to stuff on their mobile phones or Bluetooth in their car, and I get it. So we want to provide a service that case to everyone, and, and we just have a lot of different places and transcripts and stuff like that, which is really cool. So uh, be sure to check out our Curzio Research Facebook page, especially if you're a new listener and want to learn more about me or any of our analysts before subscribing to our newsletters because you can find out a lot of really cool stuff in the research that we're doing out there, where we're going, conferences and stuff all through the Curzio Research Facebook page. So, that's it for me. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you guys in seven days. Take care. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decision solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.